Hello, welcome, and welcome back to the Smart EQ model range. And this time, we're going to shine a light on the Smart to get if you need to carry four people, and that is, of course, the 4.4. Now, as tends to be the case, whenever I do anything relating to the Smart product range, a huge change is just around the corner, but that doesn't mean that there isn't still time to find out all about this car get under its skin and see what it is like. So we're going to live with the car. We're going to put it through some normal real world and very sensible tests, of course. And if you want to find out more about the rest of the range from Smart, the models that are coming, and of course, everything from Mercedes-Benz, make sure to subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss a thing. But first, I think it's time for a bit of a history lesson. This is a Smart 4.4, the original generation, which was introduced in 2004 to grow the model range, but also to add an extra dose of space, practicality, and seating to the original city car concept. The clue's in the name, the 4.4 has room for four, although this one, weirdly, has five seats. Work that one out. Anyway, the car was based on the Z30 generation of Mitsubishi Colt, but I think you'll agree, it's got such an instantly recognisable style about it. You know that it's a smart from first glance. There were a few choices of what you could have under the bonnet of the original 4.4 with a mixture of petrol and diesel engines available. But topping off the range with its 1.5 litre four-cylinder turbocharged engine making 175 horsepower was the brilliant Brabus. Now, believe me, it shifts on the road, but it didn't shift too well from the showrooms. In fact, no 4.4 shifted too well from the showroom, so after just a few short years on sale, the plug was pulled and the 4.4 was no more. And that is where our story ends. Thank you for watching. Actually, I lied. After seven years off sale, the name itself would return, but the car, well, it would be completely different. It became a lightweight, rear-engined, rear-wheel drive model with naturally aspirated or turbocharged engines available and your choice of a manual or twin clutch automatic transmission. Now I know what you're thinking, the car sounds remarkably similar to a third generation Renault Twingo. And you'd be right, because the cars were jointly developed, jointly manufactured, and they shared lots of components, including engines. Ooh. Now I had to get this bit out of my system before the inevitable deluge of comments came in saying the words Renault and engine in that order. But if you look closely, you'll be able to see that the 4.4 has the same door handles as every Renault from the early 2000s, which I'm very happy with. They look rather good. Anyway, back to the point. Why am I bringing up the Renault Twingo? Well, I had one as my first car. It was brilliant, it had stripes on it, it had no footrest whatsoever because it was right-hand drive and had a clutch pedal. But the first time I drove the identically chassis 4.4, I immediately thought, well, the steering in the Smart is a lot better. And that brings us back to the point of this video. The second generation 4.4, launched in 2014, becoming a train in 2015 as the Smart 4 Rail. I'm not making that up. Having a battery electric option made available in 2017 as the Smart 4.4 electric drive, then becoming the Smart EQ 4.4 in 2018 before getting facelifted in 2019, having an infotainment upgrade in 2021, and now finally in 2023 becoming our star of the show. Quite a lot has happened to the model over the course of its production run, so I say it's time to get living with it. Let's find out what it's like to live with a Smart EQ 4.4. This is a very, very tough task, a potentially dangerous one as well. So in here, there are some absolutely lurid statements like this and this as well that should not be mentioned in person or on the internet as they could catch fire at any moment. Luckily, if you are carrying delicate cargo, then you'll be pleased to know that the 4.4 has this little luggage strap on the front passenger seat, handy for locking in smaller items. And what I've always liked about the smart products, everything from the 4.2 to the Roadster to the 4.4 that we're in at the moment, the space is utilized. However much or however little of it there is, it is always maximized. Admittedly, the glove box is laughably small. I think the fuse box is in there. I don't think left-hand drive versions would have a glove box as small as this. So yes, you do need to fold your hat in order to fit it in there, but it is there nonetheless. The door bins are pretty generous. There's another luggage net down here as well. We'll come on to the storage area 
at the front of the cabin in a little while. But of course, I think the biggest selling point of the 4.4 is what's behind us. Let's take a look. Of course, there's room for two additional passengers, but there's also storage spots for some of the things that may come along with them. If you're carrying items rather than humans, then there are quite a few ways of folding down all of the passenger seats to turn the car into something of a mini van. If you're taking a taller item, like a guitar or a bonsai tree, then the seat base can flip over, which I think is pretty handy. Now, a bit of luggage Tetris may be required, but this is some of the stuff that I carry around with me whilst filming, and two charging cables, and there's room to spare. Lots of electric cars, they have a front storage area. Now, you thought I was going to say another word beginning with F. I'm not. I said it once on camera, vowed to never say it again. If you want to hear me say the F word, then check out my video on the smart hashtag one, our first look. But anyway, with the 4.4, you can actually gain access to the bonnet, but there's no storage area, or at least not officially. In here, there is the 12 volt battery, coolant, washer fluid inlet, and there is a little bit of space to store some sunglasses, although I must stress this is not recommended by Smart themselves. Once you're done, simply slide it back into place. Without swearing, lock it in with these two handles. Oh dear, oh dearie me. Rather well, to be honest. Don't worry, I'm not going to leave it there. There is a little bit more to it than that. Of course, a car designed for town use should thrive and excel in town. And well, yeah, I would say this is where the car is best. It feels like the right sort of place for it. Now, believe me, I loathe sitting in traffic. I hate driving through built up areas. In fact, the only city that I enjoy driving through is Milton Keynes because there is something that you can use there called the national speed limit. I don't know why more places don't decide to use that. So first things first, deals with the bumps a little bit better than the 4.2, whether that be speed bumps or the pot crevices that I'm discovering in the road. And that beep there was active brake assist telling me that the Toyota in front of me had absolutely emergency braked for a speed bump. So if I ignored that warning, then it would have applied the brakes for me automatically. The track is just wide enough to go over these sort of part width speed bumps. I don't know, I don't know what to call them, road nipples. Anyway, back to the point. The electric drivetrain really makes sense to me in a town setting. It's smooth, it's quiet, it's quick to respond. Plus there are no clutches to burn and no gears to grind as you're moving between traffic lights. And when you're stopped at the next set of lights, which you inevitably will be, the motor isn't drawing energy from the battery. Compare that to my engine still turning over at 700 RPM. But one of the, I think, hallmark features of the car that I always love to show off to anyone that will listen, or even people that don't care, has to be the maneuverability. This could make a house fly jealous with the way that it can just make such tight turns. It actually matches that of a London taxi. So you could take this around the mini roundabout outside the front of the Savoy Hotel in London without having to do a three point turn. The electric motor is quiet, but is also punchy. Accelerating from zero to 30 is where it certainly does feel strongest. But when you lift off, the car will give you what feels like a little bit of engine braking, and that is it harvesting energy to put back into the battery for later use. If you want to turn that up a little bit, then you can press this button down here with Eco on it. So that actually adjusts the throttle map and the power delivery. It limits your top speed to 71 miles an hour, I do believe. But the car can also use radar-based energy recovery. So if it detects a car in front of you, it will gently slow you down, harvest a bit of energy and put that back into the battery, of course, but it will try to keep you at a safe distance from whatever is in front of you. Another good aspect of it, it's so narrow. You don't have to stand on the brakes when a bus is coming towards you. I mean, you don't need to anyway, that doesn't actually make your car narrower, but with it being so small and you know you can see pretty much every corner of the car in fact i think you could almost reach it i bet i could touch the rear brake lights as well 
So we've seen the car in its element, now I think it's time to give it a proper challenge. The ride height is actually pretty generous in the 4 for it because it's higher off the ground than an A-Class, so when the kerb turns into a grass verge, there is no need to stop. I wouldn't enter this in the Dakar Rally though, but yes, in short, this will probably do off-roading as well as an Audi Q2 will in normal use in the UK. Quite, I would say. I mentioned earlier about an infotainment upgrade, and here it is. So it's out with the old 7-inch display that did include navigation, and it's in with this 8-inch display that doesn't include navigation. So where is the improvement? Well, first and foremost, it is so much quicker to use, so much quicker to respond. It doesn't have the response times of a Nintendo DS anymore. Secondly, it has Apple CarPlay and Android Auto included. And to be honest, I think we all know, regardless of whether you're going to be driving an S-Class or a Smart, if a car has smartphone integration, you're going to be using that screen mirroring and using Waze or Apple Maps or Google Maps or whatever. So I would say that is a good thing. There's a secondary display in front of the driver and using the arrow buttons on the left-hand side of the steering wheel. That allows you to see energy flow, battery status. On the right-hand side is the controls for volume, answering and rejecting calls. And if you press and hold this button actually, whilst using Apple CarPlay, that will activate Siri. Further down are the buttons for the cruise control and speed limiter. Again, really well placed, I think, being on the steering wheel. All you need to do is just move, well, one thumb really down to set, increase and decrease your speed. Remember, it will always come off whenever you press the brake pedal. And now for the things that wind me up about the cabin. So the adjuster switch for the mirror glass. If I'm stationary, if I'm at traffic lights and I move my knees ever so slightly away from the pedals, I find that I can be adjusting the mirror glass and without knowing it, making my rearward visibility absolutely hopeless, let's say. Down here, twin cup holder with an AUX input and two USB ports. Fantastic. Good place to put it. Bad place to put the USB ports. They are, if you have adult sized hands, they're very difficult to get in. Once you've plugged it in, just leave it there and you will save yourself about half an hour of fiddling around in the dark and quite a lot of swearing as well. Final thing that irks me, but actually makes my passengers happy if ever I'm carrying them in the rear, the steering wheel, you can only adjust the angle of it. You can't adjust it for reach at all, but I guess that works twofold. For one, it does actually bring my driving position into the front of the car, and two, it leaves room for there to be some humans behind me. Now, I know what you're thinking, a tall driver in a small car that claims to be a four-seater? Well, I think there is only one question that we can ask next. Yes, perhaps surprisingly, or rather unsurprisingly, I would say the clue is in the name. So I've found three additional people, all of varying heights, to put in here, and I would say that they're all very happy. Aren't you happy in here? They've all got heated seats and the steering wheel in front of me is heated as well, which is a nice touch to have. And yes, although one of them did say that it is a little bit cosy in here, I think the impression of space is all right thanks to the double glass sunroof letting a lot of light into the cabin. Yes, it does. The Smart EQ Control app has proven to be rather useful actually throughout the course of filming this video allowing me to keep an eye on the car from my phone and get updates about charging, but also quite helpfully in winter being able to set pre-entry climate control. Now it just does it based on whatever temperature you last set in the car, you can't alter it through the app, which is now starting to show its age, but it's a handy feature nonetheless and can get some energy flowing through the battery before you set off. As well as viewing some technical data and getting a service countdown, it can also give you an eco score, which will look like this, if you've just finished filming the B-Road section. There's also a charging station finder, although it will probably tell you to go and use a third-party map provider, but I do think the charging speed filter is quite a handy feature. You can also find your closest smart retailer if you wanted to pop in and say hello, or if you needed to take your car in for a service. Now, the interactive features on the app are included for three years from the date of activation, and renewable thereafter from the Mercedes Me store.
So ahead of me is a dual carriageway. Let's get on to it. Well, we're accelerating. 60. And 70. So, yes, even with rollout subtracted, 0 to 60 takes a little bit longer than two seconds. This is no Model S Plaid. 0 to 60 in this car takes 12.7 seconds. It's not going to set anyone's hair on fire, that's for sure. And I kind of do think the you know, having having about 100 horsepower and 200 newton meters of torque would have been perfect for this car out of town, but we'll work with what we have here. Now up at these motorway speeds, that is where electric cars typically have their range hammered because of having single speed transmissions. So at the car's maximum speed, limited to 81 miles an hour, the motor is turning at about 11 and a half thousand RPM, so it is way out of its peak performance window, let's say. I am looking forward to when geared motors start to become more mainstream. I think it is only a matter of time. Whilst I don't think it's a Grand Tourer by any stretch of the imagination, I also don't think it's a fish out of water when you take it out of the city limits. Over the course of quite a few intertown miles, I found it to be quiet, which you'd expect for an electric car, but also rather comfortable. The suspension does a really good job of soaking up the bumps in the road. It is soft, it's squidgy, but it remains composed. Overall, can you still tell that it's a city car? Yes, of course you can. You always can with cars like this. But I'd say it's a car that rises to the challenge of being driven out of its comfort zones. No. I've even opened all of the windows for good measure. Can we put this urban myth to bed yet, please? Driving means using energy, of course, so eventually you'll need to find somewhere to plug in and top up the battery. When you plug the cable in, you'll see a few coloured lights to start with. Yellow means the car is communicating with the charger, and once it starts pulsing green, that means it is accepting charge. You'll also hear a bit of a high-pitched whirring as it is accepting electricity. So I've come to GridServe in Braintree, which is where the Prodigy were formed, by the way, and it's a place that we've been a few times for videos in the past, but mostly using their four rows of high-powered DC rapid chargers. Now the 4.4 isn't compatible with them, but it can take advantage of the 22 kilowatt output AC chargers that they have as well. That's feeding energy into the 17.2 kilowatt hour capacity battery, that's usable by the way, and that can return a WLTP range of up to 78 miles. Now let's talk about the battery. It's not the biggest. Will that range, I guess, inhibit you if you were planning on doing lots of long drives with the car? Well, yes, but equally, I don't think it would be the right car for you if you were planning on taking this from here to Scotland every day. That would be about as sensible as choosing to get around central London in a Koenigsegg Yesco, which would be a very nice problem to have, actually. Anyway, back to what we have here. Small batteries, they have their pros as well as their cons. The pros, the car is reasonably light for an electric car, it is 1,100 kilos, and it means that the battery itself can recharge reasonably quickly. Every UK bound facelift model got 22 kilowatt charging as standard, along with a cable for wall boxes and domestic sockets. Whether a larger battery could have been squeezed into this car is, I guess, up for debate. So things like the Mini Electric, which I think is fantastic, and the Volkswagen E hyphen up exclamation mark, which has a surprisingly long name, both reasonably similarly sized, but ended up with batteries around the 30 kilowatt hour mark. And you can see the difference that that makes with the quoted figures. However, let's take this for what it is. How often you need to charge the battery will simply depend on what your route profile is. If I were to daily this, I would need to make sure it's fully charged when I left the house in the morning and plug it straight in as soon as I got to work and then repeat that. So I would be two full charges every single day. 
If you do much shorter routes, if you are only a few miles away from the office or it's just a quick dash in and out of town or to the station, then you may only need to charge this car once every week. I have known it to be done. So now that we've got some juice back in the batteries, let's make the most of that energy and go that way for one more test. So am I about to tell you that this is some sort of electric hot hatch? No. <laughs> no, to be honest, it still feels like a city car, but there we go, come on traction control. Yeah, it still feels like a city car, but it's got that good small car hallmark of being darty on the back roads. I absolutely love small cars. Small, arguably underpowered cars. The reason I like them is because, well, you can use every ounce of performance that they've got to offer and have an absolute whale of a time without actually getting near the national speed limit. Sensation of speed is good, the brakes are small, but they are very mighty and the regen is blended perfectly. You wouldn't know whether the car is trying to decide between friction and e-motor braking. Of course the steering remains comically light, but it weights up a little bit at higher speeds. Just get the weight to shift with the car and you can corner smoothly and just punch straight out with that Again, smooth and very consistent power delivery from the electric motor. It feels well planted, actually. Having the battery low down, but also quite far forward, it makes the weight distribution feel pretty good. It doesn't feel like it's rolling too much either. It probably looks like a totally different story from outside, but this is good. Oh, I love small cars. An unlikely B-Road Blaster. Certainly not what it was designed to do, but it's showing to me that it's capable. This isn't a car that just has to be kept in its comfort zones. Give it a push, take it out of them. See what it wants to do. I think you'll find yourself pleasantly surprised. Well, it doesn't have the biggest battery, it doesn't have the longest driving range and it isn't the fastest electric car that money can buy today, but for all of those reasons and quite a few more, I would say it's great. And here's why, it's specialized. When you put it where it was designed to be, in the city, that is where it shines, that is where it thrives. I hate driving through towns in anything much bigger than a Mini, but in this, I found it quite enjoyable and having the electric drivetrain just makes a lot of sense to me, especially in stop-start traffic. Appreciate the car for what it is rather than what it isn't and it will make sense to you. And the more I've been driving it and thinking about it, I've been thinking this would be great for me as a second car, not as a primary one, it just wouldn't be suitable. But for the shorter drives that I tend to do, say at weekends or days off or whatever, this would fit in quite well. Plus, what these cars do, whether you like them or not, the 4.2s and the 4.4s and well, I think the smart range in general really, they get people looking and they get people talking. Plus, it's a distinctive design. Even without the contrasting Tridian safety cell, you know it's a smart. And in this video, we haven't actually talked about the styling at all really. So I haven't even mentioned until now my favourite feature on the model, the soft touch model badges. Next time you see one parked up or when you're out and about, just go up to it, give the badges a rub. The owner will appreciate it. But anyway, I said earlier that there's a big change for Smart coming just around the corner. Indeed it is. There are new models on the way. I've had a go. They're really good. I cannot wait to get my hands on the model for the UK and put it to the test on the roads around here. As for the 4.4, are we going to see it again? Well, production has already ended. And this is the last demonstrator that we are going to be running as a group. But if the name does return, well, given how different this one was to its predecessor, I think it will come back as a long wheelbase limousine with a wind turbine on its roof. Who knows? We'll just have to wait and see. And there we go. We have lived with a Smart EQ44. I hope you've enjoyed the video. I've certainly enjoyed doing it and putting it all together. If you want to find out more about the rest of the range from Mercedes-Benz and Smart, check out the rest of the videos on our channel. Make sure to subscribe to us as well so you don't miss a thing. 
Thank you very much for watching this video that I actually first wrote in late 2021, so it has taken a while to get from script to screen. There's some more info and some bits left on the cutting room floor in the description, so make sure to check that out. But as always, there is more to come, and I'll see you again in the next one.